My name is Beth Harris. Steven Zucker. And we're here to talk to you today about smart history. Um, first, a couple of things to sort of maybe set us apart from some other talks you might have heard in the last day or two. Um, one is that we're not connected to any institution. So uh, although we're both art, art education administrators, we don't, we're not, smart history is not connected to any institution. And what was, there was another one that we used to, oh, we, we both publish uh, open educational resources and we are content producers. But we're offering smart history as a kind of model uh, a, a very inexpensive, uh, rather scrappy little model um, for the development of open educational resources, especially in the humanities. Um, and so you'll see an iterative structure. Yeah, and, and um, so we just put up some words that we associate with smart history, and we thought we would start by unpacking these. And when we say scrappy, we mean really scrappy. Smart history started as a WordPress site with no support or grant funding, and um, has continued with a um, small grant of $20,000, and now we operate with almost no overhead. That iterative model has been wonderful. We began Smart History, I think, really to solve a basic problem. We were both teaching both in the classroom and online. Uh, as you can imagine, teaching the history of art online can be a challenge, especially since it's so image heavy. And we ran into significant problems when we were teaching abstraction, and you can't point. Um, we also ran into significant problems when we were trying to overlay uh, text and image, um, which tends to divide people's attention. And so um, we were at first inspired by a group called Smart Mobs. This came out of um, Art, Mary Mobs. Art Mobs, excuse me, um, out of Marymount uh, College. He was a professor who brought his students to the Museum of Modern Art and began to have very informal conversations with them. We loved this idea, um, immediately grabbed an iPod and uh, a $30 microphone, went to the mat and tried it ourselves. We were really trying to respond to the fact that our students were not listening to the audio guides at the museums the way that we wanted to, that they were not holding their interest. Neither was the textbook. Well, that's right. Um, both of them had a kind of authoritative voice and a kind of singular voice that our students were not receptive to. We um, Actually, you can see in the upper right uh, a little map that we um, put up on the web uh, hoping that people would go and listen. We don't think anybody actually did, but we did make a wonderful discovery, which was that our students loved what we were doing. We eventually, thanks to Beth's husband, actually, were able to move the site to WordPress, as she mentioned, uh, using their pages capability and also put things up on uh, iTunes. Then we got a $20,000 grant from the Crest Foundation and moved to a ModX site and designed a front end that matched the content, the visual content of Smart History. And this is what Smart History looks like today. You can navigate it. You can see the menus at the top by time period, by artistic style, by artist, um, thematically. It's modeled on a kind of textbook organization. And our idea is very much that we're interested in enhancing or being a substitute to the traditional art history textbook, which costs around $150 still. In, in, um, and we should say it's $150 for those who have actually access to that. And what we're finding is that people are using this around the world who actually don't have access to the textbooks, even if they had the money. But our primary uh, mode of communicating and teaching and learning is conversation. And this is really central to smart history. What smart history is mostly is multimedia conversations about works of art. Um, we take contributions, both text and multimedia contributions from faculty. No one is paid. It's all voluntary. Um, but conversation is really the heart of it. And, and the idea is that instead of the monographic, impersonal voice of the textbook, that we can have conversations around works of art. It's much more engaging for students. We can bring in um, you know, disagreement, we can bring in emotion, we can bring in passion, we can bring in all the things that often we bring to the classroom, but that are absent from textbook. And what? we also model, this also models learning, right? So if you have, we together go, to, go and talk about a work of art, 
it can model for our students what they too can do in order to, to learn. The students really respond to this in a, in a very significant way. There's a kind of organic quality to conversation. Um, I'm not entirely sure what Beth uh, was about to say, and I had to listen really closely. That is actually an important cue to our students that they need to be looking and listening as well. Um, and that kind of learning process and the kind of surprise that takes place um, uh, really does help. So another thing that's really important to, to Smart History that differentiates us from the textbook is, is context. What we've got on the lower part of the screen is the way that the uh, pediment sculptures appear in a textbook from the Parthenon. Really decontextualized with a white background, no sense of the viewers, where it is today, what it's like to experience the work, no sense of scale. And we're really interested in re-embedding these objects in, in their context in the real world. We use multimedia to do this as well. Um, and in fact, one of the things that's most important for us is to be in front of the original object whenever possible, especially if it's in a church, even if it's in a museum, to, so that students understand the object, as Beth said, as a continuing object that, in the world that continues to accrue meaning in, in important ways. There are sound cues that we allow in as well. We don't want the sound to be too high in its quality. We want to hear footsteps. We we want to hear echoes. We want to hear, um, in a sense, the life of the, of the object in its context. We also try to bring in images that are not typically found in digital image libraries or art history slide libraries or image libraries, so images from a hardware store to explain Picasso, for example. And I think we were going to take a break and play you about two minutes or maybe one minute of a smart history video so you got some sense of, of what we're doing. and. Um, whether it was interesting to you. And let's see if this actually works. We're in San Luigi di Francese in Rome. A couple of blocks from the Piazza Navona. As soon as we walked in, I was immediately struck by the smell of incense. Most people here seem to be interested in one chapel. There's a, a large crowd of people in front of this chapel. Which is the last chapel on the left. Towards the altar. It's a pretty typical Baroque chapel. It's got different colored marble. Beautiful barrel vault. And paintings by Caravaggio. Which is really the draw. And there's probably about 20 or 30 people at any one time standing and taking pictures. Jockeying for position. Yeah. And one of the issues is the most famous of the three paintings is on the left side of the chapel. And so you see it at a very foreshortened angle. We look up at it. I'm struck by the very dark and seedy looking environment yeah. of the setting for the painting for the calling of St. Matthew, but the space of the chapel is, ornate is incredibly and ornate. It's really strikingly different. Okay, so it's the calling of St. Matthew. It is this moment when Christ, who's seen as the tall figure on the extreme right, the younger figure, with just the barest halo visible, enters in, flanked by St. Peter, the shock of light that comes down and almost divides the canvas in two diagonally. And leads our eye directly to that figure of St. Matthew, who's pointing to himself, saying, Could it saying be me? to Christ, are you, are you pointing to me? Are you, are you addressing me? So you get the idea. Actually, what we were hoping would pop up, and is in a moment, um, the lights are going to turn off, and uh, we'll have to put another euro in the little box to get the light back on. And actually, that sound pops up as well. Um, but we wanted to have, uh, a, a, to ha in, in, I mean, it's, that's such a, a wonderful example, I think, a sort of a cue for anybody who's been uh, to those chapels um, to understand what that experience is. Uh, we do get to the art history as well, but I think that kind of contextual env environment is enormously valuable for the students. The, um, one of the issues that is most important to us uh, is that when we were looking for open educational resources that had to do with art history, we were not finding any. Um, we were finding uh, None. really nothing. And, uh, and we, we really finally landed on the issue, which was, of course, uh, legal. Um, the copyright issue regarding images is something that scares off uh, virtually everybody in our profession, and it has had a profound chilling effect, thus the iceberg. Um, what we've been able to do, uh, we've been rather lucky in um, uh, finding out about a group up at the, uh, the law school at Harvard, um, the Online Media Legal Network, which is really a clearinghouse uh, that was intended initially for, um, for journalists, um, but they were very interested in what we were doing because we seemed to be um, breaking all kinds of boundaries, hopefully not laws. Um, and, uh, and what they did is they, they got us um, connected with the... Um, 
with the Fair Use Project at its Stanford Law. Um, and they've been working very, very closely with us to make sure that what we're doing is, in fact, uh, hopefully pushing boundaries but staying on the right side of the law. And, um, and this has been very comforting for us, but, it, uh, but I'm happy to say that they feel very comfortable with what we've been doing. But, but more importantly, we think that maybe we can provide an example for other art historians or cultural historians about how to safely use images. So it's really Im important to smart history that we're sustainable. As I mentioned, we run on uh, almost no budget. Um, we have a back end that's a content management, open source content management system. Contributions are voluntary. We think we've got a really sustainable model. We also have a front end with a chronological structure that we think could easily be adapted by any discipline in the humanities and which we'd be happy to give away. It's all. Uh, organized chronologically, so any I think any chronologically based discipline could use it. Before we before we move from that, um, that notion of the uh, of a, of a site that can grow iteratively, that actually can begin with a modest amount of content and can grow over time is crucial. And I just want to add to the to this, the notion that faculty are constantly producing these images, as we've heard through this conference. Um, they're constantly producing resources, and if we can simply create the um, the infrastructure, if we can create the armature on which to hang those objects. Um, we've already seen, in fact, from the last two talks, that there really is interest in doing so. Um, and so what we need to do is produce, uh, produce that kind of environment. Um, smart history has grown dramatically uh, in terms of its usage. Uh, we're still much smaller than we think we, we can be, but we're, we're getting about 60,000, 65,000 visits a month um, from about 150 countries. Uh, we're, we've grown about 85% in terms of uh, visitorship over the last, um, over the last year. Um, we don't need to tell you the textbooks are fabulously expensive, um, and uh, so much so that they account for attrition at especially public universities, um, especially two-year colleges, where our course, uh, the basic survey, is often a required course and and a real, um, uh, in a sense, a real block for for many students. Um, the textbook can account for as much as, or textbooks in general can account for as much as seventy percent of um, of the cost of tuition and fees. You all know that open is currently a mess. Uh, we um, we think it's a wonderful mess, but we're 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 watching, in a sense, how this shakes out. Um, we're interested in partnerships. Do you want to do you want to add something to this slide? Um, mostly, we're concerned about um, how closed shakes out. Um, we're we're focusing, of course, on the textbook and. Uh, and we've put up just a few of the recent initiatives that are looking at different models for the textbook. Um, these tend to be uh, relatively closed models, some less closed, like Flat World, um, but still having a paid uh, element to them. We've actually been approached by, I think, four of these, of these uh, publishers at this point. Um, but we're not entirely sure that we're comfortable with the notion of being classified actually as a textbook. I know we've been using that as a metaphor today, but we think actually that Open Educational Resources is providing a really interesting opportunity to begin to expand the way we think about resources and whether or not we really need a textbook or if we even need that metaphor any longer. So we were also very happy to be part of a research study at Olnet, and you can actually go to the Olnet site and um, have a look at that, but this is what was determined about the quality of the materials on our site. We're also looking at other models for how to, um, I guess, support our minimal financial needs. So we just uh, released a couple of travel apps that you can buy in the <laughs> iTunes store. Which we should say is just a repurposing of the free content. Um, so our idea is that the content always remains free on the web, but if somebody would like it in a nifty little package, um, we're happy to take a little bit of money for it and pay for the server. So. With the, with the textbook, we really feel like not that much has changed, and also with a lot of open educational resources. We really believe that audio and video and multimedia are, are the future, that things that are open, thinking about closed textbooks, PDFs, things that can't be <coughs> hyperlinked, um, are, are um, not as valuable as completely open resources. You know, the textbook itself was conceived of as a complete repository. We're going back, obviously, to Diderot's uh, great encyclopedia, this great ex um, enlightenment experiment, this notion that one could contain all of human knowledge within a single space. Um, it seems to me, and of course you've all seen the map of the web 
Uh, it's a little out of date now. I think that uh, supernova is much bigger now. Um, but the notion uh, that we can contain knowledge in a single space seems to us absurd. This notion of a complete um, repository, uh, a textbook functioning as uh, uh, as having that, uh, that kind of uh, authority seems to us, and seems, I think, increasingly to our students, a kind of absurd project. The other thing, um, since we, we both work in art history, both art historians, and are therefore, we therefore spend a lot of time at museums and museum websites, is that we're, I'm not really sure why we don't think about museum websites as open educational resources. I'm not sure why we have such a narrow definition that's all centered around what we make as people who work in higher education and all the other content that's on there that are OERs. And so, you know, also this difference between, you know, the online textbook and a website. Why can't we just be websites? So We were interested, actually, in how few museum people were at this conference. Um, uh, and and there's, there seems to be more library as well. But um, we think that it would be very, very healthy if that mixed up a bit. Finally, um, just a little primer, uh, an 18th century primer from New England, um, which actually looked, I think, to me, remarkably simmer, similar to our website. <laughs> um, but um, but the, the point I think we wanted to make was that um, borrowing from, uh, from the technology of Gutenberg uh, to, uh, to offer complex knowledge uh, in fluid ways um, may not be ideal. And um, we would like to unbind the the book um, and in a sense uh, ha let it um, develop iteratively uh, and powerfully and very much in response to the needs of our students and our faculty. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. If there are yeah. any. If there are any, yes sir. I think that closed sites that don't allow hyperlinking uh, should die. We, I think that there, I think that textbooks have um, an opportunity to sort of become very successful in new media, um, but in a sense shedding uh, some of the characteristics that they had historically held. I think that the idea of having a very nicely packaged, discrete. Um, uh, course, um, set of course materials that can be very rich and, and really support what goes on in a classroom will remain enormously important. I'm not sure that we want to call it a textbook. And I'm not sure it will look with like a mo one. With a monolithic voice. I mean, you, we've got Wikipedia. I'm not sure why we need textbooks anymore. A lot, of, a lot of people are starting to do that. Yep. And in fact, one of the things we didn't show is that we also want to aggregate really high quality sites in relevant places so that on the subject pages, uh, which we showed you of one, on the right, the, check this out as well, um, what we've done is to actually put in links that are outside of our site that we think are especially valuable within the context of that object or that lesson. Yeah. Other other questions? You've been a great audience. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, yes, sir. We, we, do, we do that already. Yeah, I mean, we have contributors, and our users and viewers often write, well, not often, but sometimes write and say, you know, you made a mistake in this video that you made. And we say, oops, and we publish it right on the site and say, we made this error. So-and-so sent us an email and corrected us. And It's actually a wonderful expression of the long tail. Um, and the, the correction that she's referring to was my error. And, um, and, it, and, and I was, I... I um, juxtaposed to towns that Van Gogh was working in, Van Gogh was working in. And, um, and somebody who lived in one of the towns, who was quite proud of the painting that had been made there, <laughs> um, pointed out my error. And, and I, was, I, I was so delighted, I have to tell you. And so we have had, um, and the lovely thing about, about using a content management system, of course, is that we can make those changes very quickly, um, almost instantaneously. And so uh, that, that kind of on the fly uh, change is, is welcome. We would like a, um, a larger, I think we would really like to continue to add content so that we, we are at a point now where we think we are um, within a few hundred, within a hundred objects or so of um, 
the scale of a traditional textbook. For uh, Western uh, artists. Right. I, I have to say that we did play hooky a little bit during the conference to, to make some content um, so that we, we would have Sagrada Familia in there, um, the, uh, which we did yesterday, which almost killed me. Um, the, uh, and if you haven't been there, please go. It's extraordinary. Um, uh, but, but I think that we would like to, in a sense, have that. We'd also need to uh, include non-Western material. Um, we're both Western art historians, and we need to bring in an editor. And we need to get the word out, which is why we're here. We, we would love to have more contributors to the site and to get the word out to instructors, not only to contribute, but to use smart history. Thank you. <laughs>